Good afternoon, everyone. So the Stanford Blockchain Club is really excited to introduce Brian Pellegrino, the CEO and co-founder of Layer Zero. Layer Zero, I don't think needs any introduction. They just raised a mammoth um, Series A plus round led by Sequoia, Andreessen Horowitz, and FTX. And they're building the omni-chain interoperability protocol. So I'll just let Brian kick off. We'd love to hear a bit more about your background, how you got into the space. I know you played a lot of professional poker. Uh, you sold a couple of companies um, and just have a super interesting background that involves some quant heavy MLB sort of stat arbitrage and, and things like that. So we'd love to hear just a bit more about your background and how you got into crypto. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, many people have probably heard it before, so I'll give kind of a quick rendition. Uh, I grew up in a very, very small town, 900 people, rural New Hampshire. Uh, fell in love with computer science early, um, went to school for a CS, ended up dropping out after three years to play poker professionally. I uh, did that for eight years, did like 80 countries during that time. Uh, came back to the States and online poker got banned in the States. Trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, ended up starting a company, a uh, daily fantasy sports company, right around the time that DraftKings was being founded. Whole industry rolled up that got acquired two years later. Um, Again, was just kind of like no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, I got inspired by like DeepMind's Atari agent reinforcement learning demo, wrote some machine learning models, talked to Billy Bean, uh, these conglomerate of like MIT PhDs, ended up selling those to some of the pro baseball teams. Um, started a company in the Valley uh, with first engineer out of Andreessen Horwitz, Daniel Chen, now at Sequoia, a couple guys at a Google comma, that company got acquired by people. And then now here doing this uh, company was founded with Two of my closest friends who've been building stuff together for 16 plus years now. Uh, I've been in crypto since 2013. Early on was mining, um, you know, just kind of playing with all the early things in that kind of like 2013, 2014 cycle, playing uh, with the technology. Uh, everybody kind of migrated away in 2015, came back in 2016, basically put you know, 100% of my net worth into crypto. I had, this, had convinced myself I was just going to buy a bunch of Bitcoin and like sit on it and not do anything for a very long time, like come back and check on it in five to 10 years. And then like four months later, like all of my money or like a bunch of it was in Ethereum. I was playing around, you know, and just like building stuff. Everybody's doing things. The whole ecosystem was exploding. I've just been like completely full time ever since then. So six and a half years now or something. Amazing. And maybe just introduce uh, Layer Zero to the audience. You know, what is Layer Zero and what is Stargate? And you know, maybe chat a bit about the difference between uh, you know, the communication kind of side of the protocol and the value transfer side of the protocol and maybe how those two interrelate. Yep, absolutely. So Layer Zero is pure generic messaging, nothing more, nothing less. We frame it, like I frame it internally as packets on the internet. It's arbitrary contract invocation with a payload. Um, so with that, you know, you can... Anything that you can write logic wise, that can live in smart contracts, you can use layer zero as a coordination layer. But we realized very early on that like we could launch this really amazing uh, messaging protocol, but almost everything that was happening at the time was DeFi and DeFi needs this lens of like liquidity transfer. So like great, a DEX can co-communicate, but if you're retrofitting existing DEXs, you need to be able to move liquidity from one to another to basically interact in this in this XY equals K pool that's sitting on both sides, AMM on both sides. You're a yield aggregator, right? What you want to do is unstake money here and stake money there, but solving the inventory problem, how do I get my USDC from this chain to that chain needs to be taken care of. So if you left it up to them, each of them were going to need to solve this piecemeal themselves. And they're all hyper competitive. So none of them like there's no way that Ave wants to use like compounds rendition of like doing this, right? So there's all, all this uh, sort of happening in the middle. And so we built Stargate to be this liquid transfer layer um, where exactly that, right? You want to be a DEX that swaps here, moves liquidity and swaps there. You want to be a yield aggregator that unstakes Tether here and stakes it over there and somehow moves it over. Stargate solves for that problem. Um, and so that's what it is. Stargate launched two days after Layer Zero uh, attracted $4 billion in TVL in the first two weeks, which I think marked it as the fastest growing DeFi protocol in history. Uh, and it was crazy, super insane, like certainly uh, very right tail for our expectations, uh, but it's been it's been amazing. And we're actually opening up uh, the composability portion of it tomorrow. So we're going to see all the people have been waiting to sort of migrate because that was one of the key. So the key thesis around Stargate was that Everybody prior had really built bridges to be a user bridge. Some user wants to go from ecosystem A to ecosystem B. And we had a really like strong conviction that 
everything now is moving more towards consumer focused applications. And actually the majority of the bridging volume, there's no way that sushi swap wants your user to like swap here, leave, go to an external bridge, bridge across and like hopefully make it back to sushi swap. They want you to live in their UI and basically have the whole flow executed there. Every application wants this. Wallets, front ends that sit above don't even want you to go there. They want you to do everything in their UI. So there's, there's this battle for consolidation. Uh, it's our was our firm belief that like all of the bridging volume, 95% would be driven at the application layer, not at the individual layer. So one of the core components of Stargate was that it was completely composable. So now when Sushi, so Sushi Swap to integrate us, 30 lines of code, it basically wrapped their two contracts, composed Stargate. Now what happens is Sushi on chain A swaps Atomic, exactly how Sushi works now. Uh, the USDC is then taken and moved over Stargate. All risk to liquidity, all messaging risk lives in Stargate. Sushi on chain B gets in USDC, spits out asset X. That's Atomic, exactly how Sushi Swap works now. So now this whole flow, they need zero changes to core protocol, zero liquidity to incentivize, like basically nothing to do on their end, but wrap and compose. And their user gets the experience of sign one transaction on source chain, and this whole flow gets executed. They just get dropped whatever asset they're going to right in their wallet on the other side. Uh, and so that was kind of the broad goal with, with everything that we're building is move towards that consumer experience. So right now you have essentially really fragmented liquidity pools, right? Across chains. And, you know, if you want to use one chain and uh, I don't know, for example, let, let's call it like the Ethereum L1, that's probably not going to be that useful if you're doing sort of, you know, if you need a highly performant gaming, you know, application or something like that. Whereas potentially with, you know, this combination of layer zero and Stargate, the user has one entry point, you know, call it Ethereum. And, you know, we can, uh, using this can abstract away all that complexity and, you know, for example, you know, user can own that NFT and actually, you know, go use that NFT in a game, right? And then it can like bring it back at any kind of given time. What are some of the other, I suppose, what, what are some of the, the applications that this unlocks? So, you know, what, what are you seeing, like, you know, among your kind of early users? You know, I can think of gaming as one, obviously you mentioned kind of, you know, DeFi and, you know, DEX kind of liquidity as another. And, you know, what are some of the other ones you're seeing? So I think one of the, one of the unlocks I've been most personally excited about is like, in an ideal world, when a user transfers something, they're bearing the risk of whatever they're using, right? You're using Uniswap, you're taking some risk. You're taking the risk of the protocol. You're doing cross-chain anything. You're taking the risk of the protocol. But at the end of that, risk is gone, right? Um, so that's like how a user transaction should be. You're bridging something, great. You're absorbing some bridge risk. But once you get your asset on the other side, that risk, like you should be alleviated of that. And the issue now is almost everything is built on wrapped assets. And then just a totally different security profile. So you're going to lock an asset here and mint some IOU, some wrap synthetic over there. And what that means is the user carries that risk for as long as that IOU exists, like in perpetuity. And so now the risk profile of doing this transaction is that user locks here, takes on the risk, gets issued over there. But at any point in time that those exist, this, this like local smart contract risk here can be exploited, infinite mint, your IOU is now worthless. This contract can get exploited. All the funds are drained. Your IOU is now worthless. Validation layer, the consensus mechanism can become malicious and drain or, or make a bad message to either of those. And then you can have fraudulent messages where you know a hacker is basically stuffed some clever bytes and tricks either the source to send a rogue message to destination or the destination to believe something is true on source that doesn't exist. And so... You know, we've learned this the hard way, right? The, the three examples I just gave are Poly Network hack, Wormhole hack, and Axie Ronin hack. Like all three of these things have happened and are perfect examples of this. So I think one of the big things that we were trying to do is alleviate this with Stargate, where the user takes on the bridge risk, the LPs hold the inventory risk. But once the user gets it over, it's done. So one of the things I'm actually most excited about is the, one of the things I think is the largest disruptions is really ask yourself, like, does a user need Sol? on another chain, right? Do we need Wrap Solana on Phantom, on Avalanche, et cetera? Do we need to further fragment the liquidity for all of these wrapped assets? Or what does the user actually want is to leverage their Sol spending power without losing exposure to the underlying Sol. So like the consumer experience that I want to see and that people are building now is collateralize your Sol on Solana and borrow against it directly. Take out FTM on Phantom, take out AVAX or USDC on Avalanche, ETH on Ethereum, right? And so lending and borrowing is one thing I'm super excited about is collateralizing your native chain, your source chain and borrow against it directly on your destination chain, have your ecosystem exposure, do that. NFTs and gaming, huge, huge, huge vertical, like at least 50% of our inbound has been that. And then more broadly, like 
one thing that, again, I don't think anybody else is super excited about, but I have been super excited about is once you actually have this kind of seamless coordination layer between chains, you can do things right now. We kind of write applications in this monolithic structure, the way we wrote them in early internet, right? You have your entire application in uh, you know, web 1.0, you'd host in a server, you'd be in your house. If you're lucky, you'd put in a data center, but like now everything is microservices. Everything is hyper-optimized. And that's amazing. Microservices gave us like, this is why we have Netflix streaming video and like all the things in modern internet that we have today. And now when you have communication between these layers, you have the ability to kind of leverage these chains for like their strongest orthogonal trade-offs, right? You can write an application that order of magnitudes greater complexity because you'll never be able to store everything on Ethereum. But now you can store a huge amount on Arweave, take that, bundle it up, do a really complex computation on Solana and roll the result back to Ethereum, right? Right? Now you can start to build applications and a framing in a way that is different in design space than exists now. And so that to me, I think is also super interesting, but very underexplored. So actually just to pick up on that point in this world where we're potentially shifting from a monolithic structure to perhaps like a more modular structure where apps can be built on, you know, essentially like multi chains, right? Do you think, what do you think the second order effects of that are going to be? Are we going to see, you know, essentially new L1s, uh, you know, start to kind of emerge. We're going to see, you know, just more L2s, you know, that are highly like purpose built. We're going to see sort of private chains. Like how, what are the implications of some of this? This gets asked a lot. And I, I typically say that I try not to think too much about it because I try to make it so that I don't need to care. Like for me, I, I don't need to bet on a world that's going to be all layer ones or just the theorem as a settlement layer and a thousand layer twos. At the end of the day, I build the, the most extensible core primitive that will kind of fit both of these scenarios. But what I do think I actually have strong conviction in is that what you will see in a world like this is that the shades of gray, right? Like you have Ethereum and then you have things that were kind of built at like, you know, 10% on either direction of like Ethereum, like a little bit of improvement here, a little bit of improvement there. And that will largely get washed away in time as the technology improves, as things scale. But the very large orthogonal trade-offs, those are things that will always exist or, or at least new chains, new L2s will move in that direction. So again, hyper-optimized for storage, hyper-optimized for throughput, et cetera. I think we'll see a lot more of that uh, where basically they're used for one core component, not everybody saying we're going to resolve the same thing and, and, you know, deviate in some direction and try to make this iterative improvement. And I guess just kind of a related point to this, you know, you mentioned, you know, instant guaranteed finality and that probably nicely tees us up to go into kind of the bridging trilemma. And could you actually just introduce the bridging trilemma to, you know, folks on, on the call and just, just maybe chat about, you know, how you, you know, guys, you and Ryan have architected the approach to, to this. Yeah, so this is a very Stargate focus. So when you are making a bridge, so we started, like Stargate was actually before even Layer Zero, we started working on what we thought was a better bridge. One of the issues with the existing bridges were a couple fold. One, most of them didn't give you native assets. So you were locking something here, minting this IOU, this wrap synthetic on the other chain. And the reason they did that was because if you do that, you always have inventory in the other chain because you're just creating your own, right? And so it's fine. You never have this situation where you run out on the other chain. If you have native assets, you need pools on both chains, but you might add here and go to the destination chain to take out a thousand there. And before you get there, either you didn't get an update to say it was empty or somebody else comes and takes away your a thousand, right? And so then the question is, what happens in the application flow? Like, does the user need to go and switch to that chain and pay to revert the transaction? Does the application charge the user 2X ahead of time um, so that then they can optionally roll back the transaction and then maybe refund them? Like that's a bunch of friction. Does the application pay for it? They can get drained and then spam. Like that's an attack vector. So it's really messy. Um, so the reason a lot of people didn't do these native asset pools is you have this sort of breaking uh, flow that people have to sort of build in an application layer, which is super messy. And so when we were building Stargate, one of the things that we did was this concept of instant guaranteed finality. So to be clear, it's not instant finality, but you have a guarantee. You instantly have a guarantee that finality will occur on the destination chain. Basically what that is saying is you add, you know, a thousand on, on chain A, and basically you're giving, you're allocating these credits out to each other chains. Maybe you have three chains and you say chain A, you have 300, chain B, you have 500, chain C, you have 200. And they know without needing to come back and ask you with zero coordination after that, that they can spend that. And that no matter what, if they spend it on their side, you will have it on your side to give away. So they basically never need to check again. There's no more coordination at all, no cost of that. 
and they can just spend that universally user. And so when they want to reduce that, when chain B says, uh, or chain A says, hey, I'm taking out, you know, my user wants 200 back of the LP. He's going to go to chain B and say, hey, if you haven't spent it, reduce this down from 500 to 300. Okay, at comes back. Now you're good. And so it makes it so that every other transaction is only a one directional transaction, uh, guaranteed immediately, et cetera. And the only time you need sort of an act or a two directional transaction is when you're removing LP, which is super, super nice to have. So when you're an application building on top, so Sushi is a great example. On source chain, they immediately know that their user will have execution on the destination chain. And so <clears throat> they never need to build in a flow where they need to revert a transaction. If it reverts, it reverts on source exactly how their flow works now, or if the user was like outside of bounds of slippage or something. Um, and so that basically just makes this element of composability very, very attractive when your wallets are building, when your applications are building, that they don't need to deal with this entire revert flow. Uh, that's really, really helpful. And I suppose just on one of those points, you know, you, you highlighted security as, as one of these sort of aspects that allows you to have you know, instant guaranteed finality and sort of limiting these attack vectors. And one way you do that is through splitting up the Oracle and the relayer. Could you maybe just chat a little bit about how you've approached basically, you know, constructing that design and versus, you know, maybe how like Nomad are doing it or some of the competitors are doing it? Yep. hundred percent. So like, Broadly, one of the issues we had with existing systems was that all parameterization lived at the technology layer. And we think that's super, super problematic. Right now, nobody cares because the cost of everything is really high. Um, and like, it's friction basically means less right now because we're at the very early stages. But broadly, like, you can have a game that is dealing in three to 10 cent items in transactions. And Ave, who's dealing in $500 million liquidations, and right now in every existing system, they're both opting into the exact same security parameters. So either somebody is wildly overpaying for security or somebody's not getting nearly enough security. Most likely they're both super out of bounds, but like that should never be the case. Applications have different needs on where they need to live on this cost for security curve. And there are very clear cases Again, any money market, any bridge dealing with, you know, tens of millions of dollars transactions where they are more than willing to pay for more security and then applications who basically it's too much friction to pay that cost. And so, you know, this is everything from how many block comps do you want to wait from source chain? That is a clear case of like probabilistic finality. Latency is just a measure of security, right? So you could design a bridge or a DEX or anything where if you're dealing with sub $10,000 transactions and you monitor net aggregate flow and keep it under a million dollars per 30 minutes or something, um, then basically you could do that in like three blocks uh, and have it be super, super fast. And when you're dealing in big transactions, million, 10 million, 100 million, then you make those you know 30 blocks, right? Uh, you can have this modular level of parameterization. You can have the ability to, again, um, do any of this. So that was a broad point. It was how do we make this so each application has the levers to control their own security? But most importantly, small applications don't care. So the system where layer zero is there's relayers, there's oracles. You split up the state. So uh, the oracle, oracle is just it's a bit of a misnomer. It's just any system that outputs a block header. That's the only constraint. It can look like anything totally open. Anybody can deploy that, whatever it wants to look like. But they take a block header, which contains a receipt through. Uh, the relayer takes a transaction proof out of a full node. They both submit to destination chain. You do the Merkle walk on the destination chain, and then assuming it's valid, pass it on the destination contract. Uh, but so most small applications, they don't care. They're going to say Chainlink is my Oracle, Coinbase is my relayer, totally fine. I'm willing to externalize or price the risk that both Chainlink and Coinbase will not be simultaneously malicious and colluding against me. And there's like some price I'm willing to pay for externalizing that risk. But then you have, again, largest application in the world, your Aves, your Curves, your Uniswaps, et cetera. And that's probably not a, a bet basically that they're willing to make in their structure. So now they have the ability to run one of these components themselves. So they can run say, um, you know, they run the Oracle themselves or they run the relayer. They now have complete control over their own security. Even if 100% of other participants in the network were malicious, there is nothing that anybody else can do because they're cross-referencing every single transaction while having zero unilateral control because they're also being cross-referenced by the other party. Um, so basically that is a guarantee that like, any other system that you're using, you're opting into one set of validators and that's the cost of fees, security, it's a security model. Um, 
if that validator set breaks, they can you just arbitrarily write messages to every single application on every paired network. Complete cataclysmic risk. Everything is gone. Um, they have blind ability to, to basically message anything. Take all money on every lending protocol, infinite mint, everything, right? And so this gives each application, when you're talking, dealing with the largest applications in the world, the ability to control that lever and say, hey, I will use this construct, but I want to cross-reference that. That can be their multi-sig, that can be a POS system that basically is controlling a portion of this, a ton of different ways to construct that, but it does allow them to have sort of control over their insecurity parameters. And on that note, are you guys gonna, you know, to bootstrap some of this ecosystem, do you think you'll create some of that infrastructure, that Oracle and, and Relayer infrastructure, for example, for some of the smaller players that aren't able to do them this themselves? Yep. So again, most people externalize, right? Yep. Insert application A. Ave makes their Ave net Oracle or Relayer, right? And this is a proof of stake system that's bonded by Ave. The Ave largest stakeholders are participating in uh, securing sort of cross chain uh, messaging for Ave itself. Everybody else can basically opt into using Ave, right? Proof of stake system itself for slashing, for good acting, for all of this, right? And so there's this component where as people build out these structures, others will opt into them um, because one, like the people running that component is good for them because it's revenue and for other people they're sort of leveraging the security that's being constructed in this system uh, for us we are running the relayer right now so layer zero runs a relayer um every major oracle in the world is onboarding uh, as oracles uh in the very very you know over the next sort of matters of week and then we have a list of 40 plus of kind of like the largest entities in the industry waiting to onboard as relayers as well amazing well, I'd love to open this up to the audience. So if anyone has any questions, just feel free to put your hand up, come off mute and uh, yeah, just, just ask away. But it, until then, um, Brian and I can just sort of keep chatting about this. This is really interesting. So you also, how, how do the centralized exchanges, et cetera, perhaps benefit from this world? You know, are there going to be, you know, potentially like sort of API protocols, you know, built in so that they can tap into some of this, you know, universal liquidity that, that's now being unlocked? Sorry, centralized exchanges or decentralized exchanges? C centralized. I'm kind of curious how this might impact um, you yeah. know, some of their liquidity pools. Yeah. So, I mean, if you if you saw our cap tables, right, uh, check from Coinbase, check from yeah. Binance, check from FTX, check from Gemini. Uh, there's a lot of interest on the centralized exchange piece. A lot of it is, I, like, it's very hard for most centralized exchanges to add new assets. Like, long tail of assets that exist on these chains is very difficult. So, we make settlement uh, and that like incredibly, incredibly easy where basically can be done through just a single contract on that chain and all settlement can be done uh, basically through that layer. And again, when coins live across a bunch of different chains, uh, again, that can be done, especially with the OFT structure, um, literally for the cost of gas. So rebalancing those settlement pools, doing everything uh, very, very, very easy on their part. Interesting. Aaron, do you want to come off mute? Yeah, um, Brian, thanks for coming to visit with us today. Definitely appreciate your time. Um, I wanted to ask you, thinking back to sort of some of these very specialized chains, um, you know, are we for storage, for example? Um, when you start thinking about, uh, there's a whole host of applications that haven't come to blockchain yet, and many of them are very compute intensive. So say you want to run an AI algorithm on just about anything. Um, or even something simpler like pricing options using Black Shoals. Um, you know, naturally this sort of leaves room for very specialized compute platforms. And I think one way of thinking about blockchain right now is it's just a verifiable computing scheme. And there's lots of other verifiable computing schemes too, right? There's things like trusted execution environments, SMPC, and so on and so forth. So how do you see these things coming together in the future? Yeah, uh, I think it's a really good question. Um, let me think how I frame. So there's a lot of off-chain compute systems. So I, I mean, ZKP stuff has been kind of like the hype of the last 18 months, right? It's basically all that anybody's talked to. So you, you look at Mina, you look at a lot of others who say, push execution layer outside of basically the on-chain environment and then validate sort of the output of that on-chain, right? So a bunch of protocols were like moving in this direction. Uh, Monad, there's a couple others who are, are separating sort of execution layer from everything else. So I think that is one way to potentially do it. Um, but I think they're, you know, uh, 
I would say I don't have enough meaningful insight outside of that. It's being worked on by a ton of people. It seems like a problem that is very solvable. And I think people already sort of have headway to where they know roughly how it's going to happen. And it's more about like making that happen, whatever that duration looks like. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Absolutely. Faisal, do you want to come off mute? Hey, Brian, uh, just like quickly, uh, you mentioned like microservices earlier. I wanted to know, uh, so are, are microservices, which are like off chain, are they still with like traditional cloud providers? And if you're like saving data, let's say on RV, what are some of the data structures uh, have you seen most commonly used? Uh, sorry, so just framing the question, you're asking for like the most common data structures on our weave? So if we are using RV as our data layer for, uh, you know, off chain, um, are we dumping data in like JSONs or is there a better way to do this? Yeah. Uh, so to be honest, I have not, we we're just moving, like we're finishing Solana right now. I actually haven't played with our weave yet. I just know that everybody on Solana uses it. So I should, Ryan was supposed to be on the call with me. Um, so I actually don't have the best answer for that. Um, in terms of how data is actually stored on our weave or how they deal with that. I just know that basically everybody in those ecosystems now use that, uh, basically consistently. Um, but I haven't played with it at all. And I don't know. Okay. And, and for microservices, are we still using like traditional cloud providers like AWS? No. So, uh, so basically the framing of this is that as an application right now, applications, you're Uniswap, you live in Ethereum, right? great. You have a bunch of volume. It probably sucks for you to see Trader Joe capture all the volume on Avalanche and everybody else on every other chain capture all the volume, right? Like naturally as a protocol, your goal is to drive like uh, the most fees, right? You want to accrue the most fees, accrue the most concentrated source of liquidity. And so there's like the very simple component where first thing everybody did was, you know, sushi's on like 16 chains now, and they're just a direct fork on every single chain. So exact same sushi swap, pay people, pool liquidity here, and that's fine. And now we'll connect between them. Um, but the application itself are really just like siloed instances of the same application. And then you have things now that are migrating more towards maybe like a Bancor V3 model where you have single sided pools of liquidity that live on every chain with one central asset that's kind of going in and out of. So maybe that's a stable coin, maybe that's BNT, whatever it is. So now this is like a more cohesive application that's kind of leveraging liquidity across all chains. But then you take that towards like the actual execution environment or like what is happening in the application itself and say, hey, this application sort of lives above. And this can be a lot of things. This can be state share, right? So uh, whatever it is, you're in Olympus Dow-esque sort of program where you have some piece of state that's an index price that calculates like how things get rebased, right? And so you uh, aggregate sort of state of everything, rebase, and then propagate those messages out. You can run a cron where state share is uh, shared across all instances of all applications without doing anything externally, nothing off chain, nothing triggering this. And you can have basically this cron that's circulating or a syncing state. You can have an application again that has something existing on Ethereum, this could be a game. A game is like a very perfect example of this, where you have gameplay here, but you can reach out and access liquidity or inventory there. You can access uh, elements that live on other things, or again, say, hey, this lives on Ethereum, but there's no way we can do this really complex computation that we want to do here on Ethereum. So we're going to migrate this component. It's going to execute there, and the result's going to roll back, right? So it's more like using the chains themselves as microservices and saying, have a piece of your application live here in this environment that is well suited for that, whether that's storage, whether that's actual uh, on-chain computation, whether it's really high throughput for something that you want to do, and then have the other components live elsewhere, um, but all tie it together cohesively. Sounds great. Awesome. Thank you, man. Hey, thanks. Thanks for being here again, Brian. Really love what you're working on here. Um, I'll jump in with the next one. In terms of value capture. I mean, it seems you have really focused on value creation, which is awesome. Love what this is doing for the space and what it's enabling. Just talk us through either sort of current state or potential options for what economics of a layer zero might might look like or just different, you know, thoughts or ideas that have been posited. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So 
like right now we're in a pretty fortunate situation that we've raised hundreds of millions of dollars. We literally have loaned out all of our money at eight and a half percent to Genesis, Alameda, sort of largest groups. We're cash flow positive on uh, just the interest generated, right? So we have positive burn. So we have literally unlimited room to build. Our real focus is growth and adoption. We're not really caring about monetizing early, but when you think about ways that you can potentially monetize this, like first is just capture all messages, period. Like build the thing that is used everywhere, get as much adoption as humanly possible. And the long-term uh, method would look something like, quote, like a three and a half percent fee on aggregate gas. So sum up the gas used across the two chains for this transaction, quote, a very small visa style sort of fee on top of that and capture that. Um, and so I think that's probably the most straightforward method. That's essentially zero friction on any of the applications. You're not forcing anybody to do anything. It means to hold anything external. Um, and it's just a very small fee on top of it that enables all of this. Yeah, that's that's a super interesting idea. Um, and then what about in terms of just like your organization? Um, I mean, think we've we've seen wide variance in terms of the, the Web3 world as to what an org looks like. We just talked about sort of who's on the team today, how they're structured, and maybe how you see that growing and more so from kind of a, you know, a functional and, and org design standpoint. Yeah, I think we're pretty different than most people around this in that uh, we want to stay small. So we're in org of 28 right now, 21 of us are engineers. Um, we're like, try to be fairly allergic to hiring in general. The bar is super, super, super high. Uh, we hire when we absolutely need a position. So we're not just like preemptively hiring a bunch of positions because we think we're gonna grow into it. There needs to be a direct need. The person coming in needs to be like unbelievably good at what they do. And their role is to own that piece of the stack completely. So it's very largely, a, you will have a huge amount of autonomy, everything good and bad that comes with that. A lot of responsibility will fall on you for that. Uh, there are zero PMs in the org, like very flat, non hierarchical structure in general. Um, and I think we made it work really, really, really well so far. We're terrified of scaling like beyond 35 to 40 people where we know that composition will need to change. Uh, but for now, like the focus is, is purely to keep that for as long as possible, because right now we're quite frankly in a race and the goal is just like run and build as fast, fast as humanly possible. Yeah, that's great. Um, and others, feel free to jump in with questions here too. Um, one other thing I was thinking about was just, and I, I think you've alluded to this and talked about a lot of different use cases, potential use cases, but what, what are you most excited about that's sort of in the wild right now where we might you know, be interacting with this, at least underneath the surface or things that may be coming online, like what sorts of things are really kind of out operating with this right now and um, are most exciting to you? Yeah, so I think like five of the top 20 to 30 projects in the world are going to be integrating us in the next couple months, right? Um, you will see us used at scale in production for many, many, many billions of dollars. Uh, you know, already Stargate is doing that, but even on a much more broad scale uh, very soon. And so you know, I think the goal is that you quietly start to see us more and more everywhere. But when people ask us, like, my long-term goal, five to 10 years, my long-term goal is that in five to 10 years, like, nobody thinks about us ever, right? Like nobody building an application on the internet thinks about like TCP IP or HTTP anymore. It's just like, doesn't happen, right? The goal is that you create this layer that no longer needs to be like top of mind for developers. It's like integrated more into the core underlying technologies, just like the de facto solution where the consumer doesn't really think about this or care at all. Um, and so I think that's the long-term goal, but I think in the near term, you will start to see more and more uh, very large real world applications. And also, I'll just say ahead of time, I know, I know a lot of people are like uh, different in how they approach this. Uh, in general, I very, very much value like uh, adversarial lines of reasoning, like the way my brain works coming from poker and everything else. Like I try to break systems when I see them. Like that's how I think about the world. That's why I, I think that's the only way you like harden a protocol or make things better. So like nobody, uh, if anybody has adversarial questions, like don't be shy at all. I, I don't mind. Brian, you know, as you as you build out what is essentially a public good, right? You know, for this entire ecosystem, what are some of the things that I guess sort of keep you up at night at this point? You know, what are some of the, the big hurdles that you foresee, you know, in the next you know couple of years? Yeah, I mean, I think early on, purely was like smart contract risk. Anybody who's building in this space and isn't kept up at night because of smart contract risk is uh, diluting themselves. Um, you know, that's. The, the largest concern for anybody, all the tail risks lives there. We got, we spent a million and a half dollars on 12 audits 
And after all 12 audits, we found bugs ourselves. We have an entire team internally dedicated to auditing thousands of tests we've written ourselves. Um, and it's just like, you know, you can never take security seriously enough. We built these new components, pre-crime and a bunch of other things that are really, really, really cool in how they address this by doing uh, local verification uh, before passing on messages. Um, and happy to like dive into that. But we've been doing a bunch of things on the security side as well. But like, yeah, everything that keeps me up at night is around that. Um, otherwise, it's just like, you know, there are other orgs who approach some of these problems of like trying to strong arm people into things, trying to do anything. For us, it's purely like when I sit down with a project, all that I care about is like, what is the thing like? what is the dream state of the thing you're trying to build? And like, how do we make that better, right? Our goal is just to add value to these applications. I think we've done and structured something in a way that like nobody else does right now. Um, like people will give you hypotheticals on how you can take this other solution and you can potentially do this eventually. But like right now in practice using this, there is nobody who does anything that we do in terms of like the Stargate side of things, in terms of like the NFTs, things that people are doing with that now, uh, it just doesn't exist yet. Um, and so for us, it's just that, it's give people the tools to make this abstraction, to make this consumer experience where everything is one click, where you can remove the need for gas or chains from like the, the most like lay consumer. Uh, yeah. Um, and so for us, like I focus more on that side of things versus what's scary and keeps me up at night. It's, it's all smart contract risk. And yeah, as you think about sort of expanding, and maybe this isn't really something that's top of mind at the moment, you know, given given you're a small team and you, you kind of got you know a lot, a lot of stuff to do right now. How do you think about, I guess, progressive decentralization and uh, you know basically you know DAO governance, you know, perhaps over time in the next few years? Yep. So I think broadly, most people <coughs> build these structures as a way that they can control something. You need the DAO to do a bunch of things. For us, again. We made it from day one to be as modular as humanly possible. If the entire layers of a team died today, our office blew up, everyone's gone, disappeared from the face of the earth, anybody can step in, run a relayer, run an Oracle, network will go on. There is nothing that will ever, like there is zero existential threat from us for any application building. All validation libraries are permanent. All the smart contracts are non-upgradable for any of the components that are being used. An application can be on the default, so they don't need to think about this. And when we do publish, when Merkle goes to Verkle uh, and they don't want to think about needing to update to a new validation library, we will do it for them. So you can be on the default, which is just a proxy pointing to a validation library. But if you want to point to specifics, you can do that. Uh, so the goal always from day one was to be allow basically for as much decentralization as humanly possible and as much as the market wants to introduce basically. So again, anybody can run an Oracle and a Relayer and we will have zero say component. They don't need to talk to us. They don't need to do anything. And that's the case right now from day one. Interesting. And in terms of your typical day, like how, how do you, you know, it sounds like, you know, you're working sort of like, you know, super hard on the actual technical stuff. Uh, partnerships is such a massive component of what you do. Obviously you're building out a team. Just maybe just walk us through, you know, like yesterday or, you know, what a typical day, day of the week looks like for you right now. Yeah. Um, like most of my days, these days, and can I, can I talk about the, uh, yeah, we basically just, just wrapped up like another very large fundraising round. So a lot of it has been like, uh, you know, my components are basically evangelized. That's BD that's hiring. So I'm not directly involved in the hiring funnel anymore, but like when we have candidates who we really like, and again, we're super picky about, about who we select, but when we have somebody, then it's my job basically to pitch them. And we've gotten some crazy, crazy candidates, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, like one, of, one of the people we hired uh, a while back, like, um, you know, you're talking uh, people at grade 12, uh, sorry, at age 12, you went to Phillips, he was like doing PhD level coursework at Harvard and MIT at like 15, uh, went to Princeton, was the first person ever that Princeton allowed to test out of undergrad uh, physics, tried to test out of grad school, they said no, he was like, this is a joke, went to study econ under John Nash. Uh, was chief economist for the U.S. Department of State, chief economist for BMP Pariba. Then, can, you know, we, we've gotten like really, really, really world-class candidates. And like, it's my job to close these people. Uh, so when I like pure evangelization is, is fundraising, it's BD and it's that. And like, that's what most of my time is spent on. And then, you know, the other part is architecture and product. Um, yeah, I mean, my day is basically that. It's, you know, 10 hours of calls and then the rest is being with the team and being like, this, this is what we need to do. Here's how we prioritize things, et cetera. 
And on that hiring side, you know, what are some of the profiles I suppose you look for other than just sort of, you know, crazy, ridiculous testing out of, you know, Princeton early, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 everything. We pulled people out of AWS. We pulled people out of Red Hat. Um, we mostly hire from outside the space because we think the Delta is too high inside the space, right? I can get a kid who wrote, you know, did a coding boot camp, wrote, published a contract in Solidity, or I can get like a PhD in distributed systems who like, I need to teach Solidity. And it's like, they're the same price, right? It's just like completely out of whack at the moment. Um, what do we look for? We look like culture fit above all else. It needs to be people who care a ton uh, about the work. Like if you want to come here, you're going to work incredibly hard. You're going to be surrounded by like amazing, amazing people. And like our goal is to minimize churn as much as humanly possible. We treat our people incredibly, incredibly well here. It's a very small group and everybody just works super hard. Like uh, we have somebody coming tomorrow who I hope we close. I'm very optimistic that we will, but she's like fascinating, right? She, um, Harvard at 16, uh, dropped out of Harvard six weeks in CS Harvard to join a streetwear company, uh, as an unpaid intern three weeks later, negotiated founding equity exited for hundreds of millions of dollars. The company level went back to Harvard, joined a VC, uh, VC mandated, uh, everybody there has to have a degree, went back to finish. And now basically is, is hopefully coming for us, right? It is just like, we love people with eclectic backgrounds. We love people are very, very good at like a function that they own. Um, yeah, I don't know. Always looking for the best yeah. people, period. Um, there is no set profile. And speaking a little bit more about your sort of somewhat eclectic background, being a professional poker player, what are, what are some of the things that you think you've learned from that that you're able to bring into this? And, you know, I'm thinking of systems design. I'm thinking of how important game theory is in designing even just tokenomic strategies, right? Um, and, you know, finding, you know, points of potential failure. Just maybe talk a little bit more about how that experience is, um, I suppose, advised and influenced, you know, the work you do now. Yeah, I think there were a lot of things that I learned from it. One, like, absolutely. Again, like, you have to understand that from age 15 to age 26, uh, like, my brain developed just in a weird way that most people's don't, right? So I was playing, like, 70 hours a week of poker online, six to eight tables, heads up, highest stakes in the world that you could play. And that means I'm making a decision about every 0 0.3 seconds. So if you can imagine 10 hours a day, every single day, like, you know, I – for the entire time I played poker full time of like 10 years, I took three consecutive days off once ever, right? So 10 hours a day, this is my brain. And every single one of those snaps is me making a decision that is for tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's no time to evaluate. There's no time to go back and think about good or bad, be happy or sad. It's just pure decision-making. Are you doing the best possible things all day, every single day, right? So my brain like developed in that way of like just rapid fire, every single day decision-making. Um, and like clearly how to manage and evaluate risk, how to try to think from a, like my, so I, I didn't mention one of the other things I did is I, I co-published academic research with Noam Brown and Fair. So we made the best uh, poker bot in the world by like a factor of 5,000 on the work of Carnegie Mellon, University of Alberta, it was 5,000 X more performance, created our own new convergence algorithm for counterfactual regret minimization, et cetera. But the way to frame like, to think about systems, think about incentives, thinking adversarially, exploitation, uh, how people basically play off that, hugely important. But I think one of the biggest things I learned in general from poker was how to think asymmetrically. So I think one of the issues I had early on is like I had this, I had one job ever in my life. So this is the first paycheck I've taken since I was 18 years old. When I was 18 years old, I worked in a networking lab at the IOL. Uh, working on early IEEE technologies, testing and conformance. I wrote, you know, my first six months, I wrote this entire test suite from scratch, created the product, got the customers, you know, made them a million dollars a year, let's say. They brought me into their office and they were like, amazing job. This is the best, you know, we possibly could have expected. We're going to give you the maximum allowable raise of 50 cents an hour. And it was like from 1025 to 1075. It was like, all right, you know, this isn't for me. Uh, and so like what drew me to poker was you had this like really, strong meritocratic environment where I knew I was going to be getting out of it exactly what I put in. If I worked harder than anybody else and I became one of the best, I was going to basically have those sort of upside. And I had complete freedom of where to work and when to work. So if I wanted to work 80 hours, fine. If I want to work 20 hours, fine. And what it took me probably eight years to realize, you know, I, I became one of the best poker players in the world at, at the game that I played. Um, and what I realized at the very end of it is that there was just no asymmetry. I was a very highly paid consultant. Um, and so looking back, 
you know, there, I, I love this, this anecdote from uh, my friend. My friend's uncle was the, the highest ranked uh, non-Russian chess player in the world. His father was incredible at chess. At five years old, he told them, you know, dad, all right, I'm ready. I want to learn chess. And they said, like, don't bother. You're too old, right? Um, and so I always think about, like, chess is this great example of if any of us decided right now or even for our kids that we wanted to become the seventh best chess player in the world, Basically, none of us would be able to do it, certainly without any certainty. Everything is very, very, very hard. But even if you did do it, you achieve that like hugely right tail outcome. The seventh best chess player in the world like still needs to have a real job to support themselves, right? There's like, there's no asymmetric outcome on the other side. So I think the first thing for me was like, do I want to go back and try to become incredibly good at something again? Like everything you want to do that to takes a huge amount of work, a huge amount of personal sacrifice, everything else. So one, do I want to do that? And then if I want to do it, pick something that has that asymmetry where if you do hit that right tail outcome, you have all the upside in the world, right? And I think that was the biggest thing I took away from poker was that I wasted, you know, 10 years achieving this massively right tail outcome to basically make like, $3,000 an hour, right? I was like a high paid lawyer, hooray. Um, and there was just like the moment I stopped working, I like wasn't making any money anymore. And so I had to just be working all the time. And so, um, you know, that part of it was just like very eye opening for me to how I frame decision making in general, what I pursue, whether it's from the investing side of things, the building side of things, all of that. And I think that's been one of the most valuable, just general life lessons that I've had to learn myself. As you set out to build this company, yeah, and I'm thinking, you know, a lot of the folks on this call are early stage founders or, you know, thinking about sort of taking that next step in, in fundraising. You pretty much designed an all-star cap table, right? I feel like you've got sort of every partner in there that you could sort of, you know, hope to have. What are some of the ways, how, how did you think about designing that cap table, first of all? And I suppose like now that you've, now that you have these partners on board, on board, how do you kind of, you know, utilize them and, you know, what sort of support do you look for from them, if any? Sure. Uh, I'll give you some answers that most people probably won't give you. Um, so one, we didn't set out to start a company, right? We were tinkering. We started this entire thing by me and my two friends uh, getting spammed every day about Binance Smart Chain, having more volume than Ethereum, et cetera. And we were like, okay, let's just build a toy game to see what this looks like. So we're building a gladiator game between two chains. And we realized very early on, like you can't do anything interesting without some central coordinator. And they said, well, bridges exist. Like, what do those look like? And so we looked at bridges and we were like, just like horrified. We're like, you know, we would never trust millions of dollars, let alone like billions of dollars. So these like, let's start building an, a bridge, a better bridge. And then in building that, we realized we were still inventing our own transport layer because it didn't exist. And like, that was the generalizable problem. So all of this, right? The round we're raising, you know, just raised, I, I shouldn't say too much about it. Very high valuation, et cetera. This is just happening. We still don't have a pitch deck. We've never had a pitch deck. We've never been officially fundraising ever, right? Um, our last round, we had six preempts. Um, so six different term sheets preempting the, the prior round. Uh, and so... For us broadly, like, again, we just set out, like, we were hugely excited about the thing we were building. We were building it because we thought it was interesting. We needed, like, there was a direct need for it. We were not building this to fundraise. We were not building this to make a company. All of that has been extraneous. And I think that's actually been one of our biggest benefits is that, like, we just didn't waste time on, you know, building a pretty pitch deck or going through all the motions or doing everything. We just showed people what we were building and thought was awesome. And then everything else followed. But then once we did get it, so all of our rounds, every conversation, the first conversation has been, we want to give you this amount of money and take the entire round. Like we want to be the sole investor, every single one. Um, and then we basically use that as a catalyst to say, Hey, okay, let's construct what we think is the optimal round. So what we care about more than anything else is integrations. We want volume and we want big integrations early on. Um, and so if you look at our early round, we're clearly optimizing for DeFi integration. So we have the largest or second largest stakeholder of Aave, Sushi, Synthetics, Compound, uh, every single major DeFi protocol in the world. And then when we got to the next round, it was more like, hey, we already have all the DeFi exposure. Now it's like, now we're getting interest from PayPal or their first ever token investment in us. We're talking, you know, we were talking to Robinhood and Stripe and every major consumer fintech product and the largest banks and financial institutions in the world. And it was, hey, this might look very differently than what we originally intended with a pure DeFi skew. How do we get the people who have built the best companies in the world, right? This is the Andreessen's, the Sequoia's, et cetera. Uh, that's when we started sort of bringing in like, what does this look like? And then through all of these rounds, the thing that we've realized is 
quite frankly, 95% of your investors will be 100% useless. You will like never talk to them again or barely talk to them again after day one. And so, you know, you have like your nth crypto fund who's just like Pareto dominated by this, this other fund or like whoever who just does everything they do, but like mostly better. Um, and so it's just like, there is so such diminishing returns and value on the tail. You're gonna have two to three core investors who spend all of your time with, they are massively value add. You go to them first when you have questions, you do that. And basically I treat everybody else as like, like a silver bullet, basically. Uh, I treat people as, if I'm not bringing in this nth fund who I don't really care that much about is not going to be overall that useful to me, then maybe it's better that I get somebody again who, who I like, maybe I almost never talk to them, but when I go to them, I'll have one specific ask and I will expect them to fulfill that ask. Right. And maybe this is somebody who's going to like, you know, maybe when I'm stuck in a Panamanian prison cell or something, I, I call them, right. Maybe it's like that kind of silver bullet, but maybe it's like, Hey, we finally done this thing. Disney is launching this project. And like, I want that intro to like the upper tier of Disney to have this integration, like start those conversations, right? It's people who are very close ties to like the people who you think you're going to be very closely aligned with long-term industries you see on the fringe who maybe aren't your traditional VC, but are the CEO of massive companies. They're the you know biggest angels in the world, et cetera, right? So I've started to think a lot more of those lens of, hey, we have most of what we wanted from this core group here. What can we utilize this long tail to have those individual asks, start those conversations, get us in the room that we wouldn't normally be able to get it to? <coughs> Amazing. That's a, that's a really, really helpful overview in terms of how you're thinking about that. Josh, did you have a question? Yeah. Hey, hey, Brian, I'll jump in with, with kind of a, a fun one and just a, a speculative question, but as a former professional poker player, clearly with a lot of success, what do you think the role of gambling games in, in Web3 either could look like, should look like, will look like, just any sort of thoughts or commentary there? I think it's a space that when people think about economics and gaming, that naturally comes to mind. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the biggest issues is everything on chain is deterministic, right? So randomness is incredibly difficult. Right now, people use something like VRF or you know something where you need to query this external service to get randomness on chain. So we've been thinking a lot about that, about what that might look like or ways to aid with that. But I think until you have actual good things like compelling gambling, randomness, et cetera, you need that component on chain to make it super worthwhile. Um, other than that, it's basically just been a, a way to like ease the settlement layer. So actually poker, I joke around a lot because, uh, you know, I, 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 can't, I came from poker. I, I've known like everybody in there for a long time. The poker community of February 5th, or sorry, April 15th, 2011, online poker got banned in the States. All the big poker sites left and you had all these shady poker sites that still existed, but all of their payment processes were banned. Money bookers, net teller, scrail, PayPal, none of them allowed it anymore. So all of the poker industry adopted Bitcoin in like 2011. So like the number of mediocre poker players I know with like eight figure net, net worth is like astronomical, right? It's like people are like exposed to these things early on, but all of the poker and gambling community in general ended up adopting this as a settlement layer of one. Now you, everyone aggregated Bitcoin as they were depositing around these sites. And then two, uh, basically, you know, you had things like Nitrogen and others who basically created these provably fair randomness where they'd published the string of hashes and then, you know, the seed afterwards. Um, and so, you know, that was a way that like, they basically dealt with as an asset base more than on-chain. So I think on-chain randomness, on-chain gambling is still being explored. And I think it's surprisingly very difficult to do well right now. But I think a lot of people are thinking about how to do that better. And I think it's hugely interesting, especially as gaming uh, gets more and more interested and in, in gaming is getting more and more interest in the space. <coughs> Well, on that note, Brian, I don't want to take up any more of your time. This has been honestly incredible. I've loved every minute of it. I've learned a ton um, and I've already got a bunch of messages from folks saying how much they're enjoying it. So I think people should hop into the Discord, Layer Zero's Discord. They should you know, check out the developer docs and just basically you know, see what they can do and start, start building on the, play, on the space. I think this is one of the truly paradigm shifting you know, uh, like protocols really like that's, that's, you know, that we've seen in quite some time. So I'm super excited about it. Brian, any, any parting words? No, nope. um, thank you guys so much for the time. I'm super accessible in general. So like ping me on Twitter, ping me on Telegram, Discord, wherever it is. Um, if anybody's building, uh, certainly happy to, to help that. And if anybody is uh, 
feels like they're incredible at something and, uh, you know, looking to join the hiring stack. We, we are always looking, but the, but the bar is very high. So hopefully we'll be talking to, you know, whoever, whoever meets that. So yeah, thank you all so much. Amazing. Thanks again, Brian. All right. Awesome. Thank you all. Talk soon.